by the choir has the good fortune of remaining in the front two rows. Do they really? Okay. So noted, uh, Ethel, we will do that from now on. Every Sunday, whether they're singing or not. Uh, it's good. Uh, the, several gave me some prayer requests uh, between Sunday School and Church this morning, and I'll see if I can remember them. Uh, Isabel Reimer is here, but uh, George is not doing well at all with uh, uh, having back problems. He's walking, using a walker, and his sister, uh, who lives in Seminole, uh, had surgery this week. Shirley Cartner told me that her sister, is it Mary? Mary? Uh, is in the hospital and, and in, is in an emergency situation in the hospital, and would like you to pray for her. What did I miss? That's right. Okay. Virginia is uh, with her uh, mother and stepfather this morning, and uh, he's having some medical problems, so you'll be praying for that. All right. Did I get all of them? Okay. Take your Bibles, if you will, and, and turn to Galatians chapter 6. And uh, after we have found our place in Scripture, we will pray. Galatians chapter 6. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just uh, glorify your name as we have just sung. Because you are a great God. You have loved us. Before the foundation of the world, you've chosen us in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and predestined us to be conformed to the image of your Son. And we thank you, Father, for this grace that you have brought to us. We thank you for this congregation and each one in it. We know that there are difficulties that we have just enumerated uh, of people who are sick and the ones we have listed in the votes, and we just pray, Father, for each of those situations this morning. We have uh, listed Hari Virnas as a missionary to pray for because he's ill, but we need to remember our missionaries at all times for the work that they're doing around the globe. We're just so thankful for people who would leave this country and uh, the benefits that are ours of living and the comforts that we have here to go to foreign cultures and foreign countries and just present the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way, the truth, and the life. And we pray for all missionaries who are doing that, that you will encourage their hearts. We have many of them that we know by name, and Father, we lift them before you and we just pray for them. Bless uh, in what we will be saying now as we look to your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit might uh, teach us and touch our hearts Give us a, a message that we can share with others, a hope that we can share with others because of the good kind of God that you are. We pray this in our Savior's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are coming to the last chapter of the uh, book of Galatians, and as we have gone through Galatians, we have uh, seen quite clearly the theme of grace. In the first chapter, it was grace in the gospel that the gospel which we proclaim is a gospel of the grace of God which is separated and totally divorced from any kind of works or merit. And uh, that is the gospel that we proclaim. We saw in the first two chapters the, the grace that was given to us through the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, how he did not receive things from the, those that were apostles before him, but the Lord Jesus Christ, in his wisdom and goodness, revealed a message to the Apostle Paul for us in the church today, something that the other apostles did not know. But Ephesians chapter 4 says that they learned it via the Holy Spirit. But Paul received it by revelation of Jesus Christ himself. We saw also in this book that the principle that is, work in the, is at work in the believer's life, or to be at work in the believer's life, is the principle of grace in our sanctification and not law. Legalism does not grow Christians, it burdens Christians, and it stymies their growth. But grace teaches us, as Titus says, to live godly and righteously in this present age. 
And now as we come to the sixth chapter, we're going to see grace again. And this time we're going to see grace in action and grace how it relates uh, to our fellow, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ, primarily those. Uh, we know this is grace in action because it follows the chapter, uh, the, it follows chapter 5 where we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, the, it, we contrasted the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And with us, our desire is that we would walk in the Spirit, that we would live in the Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit. And when we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit has a chance to be manifested in our lives. As we abide in him, he brings those sprouts of fruit uh, through our lives, and we manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 6, we have here that fruit of the Holy Spirit being used as we minister to one another. And the first theme, or the first subject in verses 1 and 2, is the subject of restoration. I, I, it just thrills me that God is in the restoration business. We may be in the throwaway business, but God, once he sets his hand on you and you become his child, he never, never forsakes you. He is always working with you and he's always seeking if you depart from him or if you depart from uh, the truth that is in Christ Jesus. He is there to restore you. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, concept of the rehabilitation work that God is doing in the lives of believers. I just am so thankful for that. We've got this idea that God is lo looking overhead on us and he's just ready to pounce on us every time we do something wrong. And make no mistake, we do do things that are wrong. We do sin. But God in his grace has forgiven us. All of our sins have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Past, present, and future. He's taking care of that. And God, so God is not sitting there to judge us. Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, has borne our judgment. There's no judgment to us who are in Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus has borne our judgment. And so God is not sitting there to pounce down upon us. He's sitting there as a loving parent trying to nudge us along and push us on, and he's smiling on, it, on a, upon us and prodding us on to greater submission to him. Well, in the first two verses here, Paul talks about this idea, I think, of restoration. He says in verse, let me read verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man or woman, if a person is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think those two verses go together. I don't think the second verse is a separate thought from the idea of restoring someone who has been taken in a trespass. The person here in verse 1 who was overtaken in a trespass has the idea of uh, taken before. Uh, some people even believe that this is saying if you see someone before they are going to sin, you know, get with them. Now that may happen, but boy, I'll tell you, that rarely does that happen, that you see another Christian and know another Christian is going to participate in some sin, and so you go try to rescue them or minister to them. But this, I think, has the idea of, of someone who was taken in a sin before they even realize what they have done. It comes upon this, and they are overtaken in this trespass. And right away, we take this trespass to be a sin. It may be. It is some sort of a fall. The, the, the believer, these are believers working with believers. The, the believer has taken some sort of a fall. And it is, uh, it is what kind of a fall we don't know. It may be a deviation from truth. It may be that someone has, uh, has uh, fallen away from a particular truth that is taught. 
It may be, in the context of all the grace and law business in the book of Galatians, it may be that a person might be resorting back again under the law, resorting back to legalism. And so Paul is saying, when you see someone who's about to take a fall or is taking a fall, restore such a one. Now, when a trespass is committed by anyone, it has to violate a certain standard. We need to understand what standard it is. We need to understand that uh, Paul was given a standard concerning the church, the body of Christ. And we, as members of the body of Christ, are not under the Mosaic law. We're not under law, we're under grace. So Paul here is not talking about violating the Sabbath, no matter how you want to define that. Uh, Some people define it in different ways, you know, and believe that the Sabbath is moved and all that kind of uh, thing. But in the basic uh, Mosaic law, it was the Sabbath, Saturday. Uh, Paul's not talking here about violating the Sabbath. Paul is not talking here about uh, someone violating the code of circumcision or the law of circumcision because that obviously is not in place. His whole book has been written here that if you believe that you need to be circumcised according to the law, then Christ profits you nothing. So we have to recognize that the standard by which Paul is measuring these people is the standard of grace and it's the standard of the mystery that was given to him. And uh, missing the mark, as the idea of trespass is, missing the mark has to do some way with missing that mark of, uh, of the God's revelation for today. And, and as I said, it may be missing the mark, and I think this is probably very much a part of it, missing the mark by resorting again to legalism. Well, if you see someone who is overtaken in some sort of a fall, Paul goes ahead and says, you who are spiritual, the word you is plural, so he's talking about uh, 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 several who are spiritual. Now, what does that mean? Well, I, I think it's very simple in the context. Look at verse 25 up above in chapter 5, verse 25. If you live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Spiritual ones are those who are walking by the Spirit. And uh, it, it is, it is a, a, a sense of maturity on their part where they are walking by the Spirit. You who are walking by the Spirit, he says, restore such a one. Now, uh, I want to ask you something. I was thinking about this as I was preparing this. How many of you have a VCR? Okay, I just wanted to—I just wanted to say that I was preaching, and about seventy people raised their hands. No, um, I, I'm hearing a phone, and, I, and oh, I, it was maybe him, maybe Brad. I think was getting news about his mother. Well, anyway, how many of you have ever had a VCR break down? Break. Okay. I, I think every, everybody has a VCR. How many of you had your VCR repaired? No, no. You had it repaired. That's about half of the people, I think, that put their hand up. You know, um, we are in a society today which I would call a throwaway society. I had uh, one or two VCRs that had broken, and uh, I didn't repair it. I had got the VCR for $140 or something like that, and, and uh, if I took it to a repair shop and got it repaired, well, that will be $225, you know that? That kind of thing. It's hard to find people who will... See you later, Brad. It's hard to find people who uh, will repair something and, and, and bring it back to its original condition. But virtually, uh, so much of equipment today that we have... How many have repaired a toaster lately? <laughs> you know, nobody repairs a toaster anymore, right? You used to have a fix-it shop where you'd bring it to a guy in, in a fix-it shop and they would take it and say, well, this, uh, this wire burned through here and, and just patch it up and, and it's fine. But we don't do that anymore, do we? We're, we're in a throwaway society. If, it isn't, if it's broke, throw it away, look for the next sale, get another one. That's about the way we do it. Well, you know, we may become casual in that way when we're talking about 
other Christians. As I was uh, preparing this message, I, I got to thinking about Greg Bennett. Greg was a, a youth pastor here several years ago. And all of you know that he got uh, involved in gambling, became addicted, and, and possibly still is addicted to gambling. You know, and, and what has been, uh, what is our goal with someone like Greg? What do we want? We want to see that brother restored. I don't know what the Lord is doing in his life, but I must admit, and as I, as I thought about this, I must admit, that the last couple of times I've been up in Grand Rapids, I've not made any attempt to call him, and I should have. I should have just called him just to show that I'm interested in him, see? And that I want him to be restored. I want him to come back. But he's away from the Lord right now, and uh, as far as I know, probably still involved in this addiction that he's hot, got, and it's going to need, uh, it's going to be the Lord that's going to take him and restore him and bring him back. But... We are kind of in a throwaway society where if we can't fix it real quick, in a Christian's life we tend to give up on him or her. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the, the thrilling thing about God is that God doesn't work that way. God doesn't throw us away just as soon as we do something wrong. And we, we can have a pattern where we live away from him. But God doesn't give up on us. He keeps calling us. He keeps making the phone call. And he keeps, he keeps ministering to our lives and uh, seeking us to come to our senses and so on. Well, uh, this idea of restoration here is not uh, painless. It actually has the idea of if a bone is broken, you set it. And I've never had a bone broken, but I've heard people who have had an arm broken or a leg broken and how you have to pull it and, and put it uh, in back in place and so on and then put the cast on it. It's a painful process. can be a painful process. But it is the idea of mending a bone and uh, properly fitting it together. And uh, this is something that we need to remember. What we're, what we're trying to do with somebody is to mend their broken lives or mend the broken things that are in their lives. Well, if you see a brother or a sister who is overtaken in a, in a trespass, you people who are walking in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, will be led by the Lord to restore such a one. And when you do it, Paul says, do it in the spirit of gentleness. Uh, that's interesting because in the fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. So we know that this is a Spirit-conducted affair. This is a something which is done by the Spirit of God in the life of, of the person who are the persons who are seeking to restore this person. And uh, then he goes on and he says here, not only uh, restore such a one in a gentle spirit, you know, some, sometimes we can be very, very heavy-handed when we want to straighten somebody around and change somebody around. We can get very, very uppity. That's not what God is saying here. We need to do it with humility. And that is a work of God in our lives, too. So we knew it, needed, it needs to be done on the part who are the, of the, those that are controlled by the Spirit. It needs to be done in a spirit of gen, gentleness. And then he adds a very interesting thing here. And he says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, this is singular. Before, it was all of you who are being controlled by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit, you restore such a one. But here he says, you individuals, you look at yourselves, at each person involved, uh, lest you be tempted. And that says to me that although we have the nature of Jesus Christ, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, we have the na our nature is the nature of Jesus Christ himself. But we still are at home and living in this body, and so we are susceptible to the temptations that are around us. Never, never uh, get over that, that you, or think that you are beyond something tempting you or pulling you down or affecting you. 
It's a marvelous verse, isn't it? Uh, you see someone who's overtaken in a fault. You who are spiritual, go to him. You be led by the Spirit to do so. Go to him or her, and when you do, restore them, do it gently, and watch out for yourself, lest you be tempted in a similar manner. And then he says, bear one another's burdens. Now, if you go down to verse 5, it seems like there's a contradiction here. In verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. And in verse 5, he says, each one shall bear his own burden. My version has different words there, which is uh, good because these are two different Greek words. But let's look at the first one in verse 2. Bear one another's burdens. The word burden here is uh, the Greek word baros, from which we get the word barometer. A barometer measures the atmospheric uh, pressure, correct? The weight of the atmosphere, so to speak. And so this is a pressure that is upon someone's life. It is a burden. It is a heaviness, a difficulty that has come into someone's life. And this is big. This is big stuff. Uh, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, he says. The idea here of bearing one another's burdens is not for the purpose of transferring that burden over to yourself. But it has the idea of ministering to someone so that they can bear up under that load. It has the idea... Of, uh, of having empathy with somebody who is under duress or under some sort of a strain. And being empathetic with them in the sense that you share the word with them. You give them the word of God so that they can use that word of God in order to bear up under the burden that they've got. Uh, this is a responsibility within the body of Christ. Bear one another's burden. Uh, some of us have uh, heavy loads at times that we need to carry. I think Brad is going through a time right now. Uh, Brad, um, his burden is, is under a lot of pressure. There's a burden that's been placed, a heaviness that's been placed upon him because of the uh, illness of his mother. And he's a, uh, he's a very caring person, and so it's getting to him. If there's any way that we can help Brad in this kind of a situation, it would be one way that we could bear one another's burdens. Uh, all, this is our responsibility, all of us. doesn't say some of you, but we are to bear one another's burdens. It is part of the process of being part of the body of Christ, the family of God. And we need to help others. It may be a spiritual burden. It may be a physical burden, you know, an emotional burden, whatever it might be. We need to be there to bear up on one another. And then he says, for this, in doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ. Well, uh, the question might, would be, a good question would be, what is the law of Christ? Well, uh, if you go back, just look maybe in, uh, across the page in your Bible, in chapter 5 and verse 14, uh, Paul says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that that's the law of Christ that, uh, that Paul is talking about here. I'd like to take you through some scriptures where we uh, look at this law of Christ, and I think the law of Christ is love. Uh, I'd like you to go back to Romans chapter 13, if you would. Romans chapter 13. And I'd like to begin in verse 8. The Lord had something to say about love and about it being a new commandment. Uh, but in Romans 13 and verse 8, we have, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. This is Paul saying this. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm 
to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And again, remember in the context of Galatians, what is love? It is a fruit of the Spirit. It is a ministry, a work of the Holy Spirit in the, in the lives of believers. In John chapter 13, I don't think there is, this is probably one of the subjects that has greatest agreement, no matter where you look at it in the Word of God, this concept of love. In John chapter 13 and uh, verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now why does he say this is a new commandment? Well, uh, I, I think there's a reason for this. It is, it is given in the law in the Old Testament, but our Lord says this is a new commandment. Uh, the word new here, there are a couple of Greek words for new, and this word new has the idea that this commandment that he's giving to them is new in quality. Not new in time, but new in quality. And I think it's in, in anticipation of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because the Old Testament saints, as they were given the law and told to love one another, they did not have the Holy Spirit. They did it themselves. They tried to love themselves. And of course, whenever you do that, there, you, you have failure. But the Lord says, a new commandment I give you. And I think he's anticipating the kingdom, which was soon to come. It was going to be near at hand. And the coming of the Holy Spirit, which was going to be in them, according to the kingdom promises and so on. And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, shortly after that, the Apostle Paul received the message regarding the church, and the church of the body of Christ began. And so the kingdom was put in abeyance. It was held off for a while. But one of the things that we have as members of the body of Christ is that we have the Holy Spirit. It's something that is kind of uh, uh, comparable to what the kingdom saints are looking forward to. When God uh, says in the Old Testament he's going to give them a new heart and he's going to put his spirit within them. Remember those passages in Jeremiah and so on? That's for the millennial kingdom. But we as members of the body of Christ, not living in the kingdom today, yet we have the Holy Spirit. And so there's a new quality about this commandment of love. It is not to be something that is done by ourselves in our own energy, but it is a fruit of the Spirit. It is because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And I think the Lord Jesus Christ was anticipating that, and that's why he called that a new commandment. Uh, look in uh, Galatians chapter 5. Well, you can keep your place there. Let's go to Ephesians 5, uh, chapter 2. This is where our scripture reading was this morning. Galatians, uh, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Uh, we can love him because he first loved us. And Christ loved us to the point where he gave his life. He willingly went to the cross and sacrificed himself and a righteous being who had never sinned became sin for us. Our sins were placed upon him. That was an act of love. And uh, he was our sin bearer. And as we believe in him and trust in him as our sin bearer, we have the life of Christ. We receive the life of Christ. We can love him only because he has first loved us. And then in Galatians chapter 5, well, I think I already read that one to you, verse 14. Uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that the uh, law of Christ that is being filled here by bearing one another's burdens is the idea of loving and allowing the love of Christ to uh, work and manifest in our lives. Well, that is what Paul has to say about restoration. Restoration restoring someone and, and uh, 
helping someone with the burdens that they're carrying. I hope that maybe there's somebody that you're thinking of that will, the, will be brought to your mind uh, that you would like to see restored. Uh, someone that's away from the Lord that you'd like to see them come back. And uh, pray about that person. And if there is some way that you can minister to that person to restore them, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful program that God is in, that God does in the body of Christ. Well, the next thing that he talks about is uh, conceit. In verses 3, 4, and 5, let me read them first. He says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. This uh, has the idea of, uh, uh, obviously, of conceit. In verse 3, if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He's deluded. Um, in verse, the last verse of chapter 5, he says, Let us not become conceited, <coughs> provoking one another, envying one another. Conceit will do that. It will provoke people, and it will cause you to envy one another because you're so conscious of others. But isn't it true what verse, so true what verse 3 says? If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Uh, of course, you don't know anybody like that, do you? Thinks themselves to be something, they're really not, so they're deceived. I think sometimes we can see it in others a lot quicker than we can see it in ourselves. And there can be a sense of uh, conceit in our own lives. And it's a terrible thing that does harm in the Christian's development is the idea of thinking more of yourself than what you should think. It is the opposite of humility. God resists the proud, but he exalts those who are humble. And so we need to have this proper perspective uh, from God, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, teaching us and telling us who we are. And then in verse 4, he says, uh, let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. This is a good thing. It sounds like this might be a bad thing that's going on here, but I think what it does is to look critically at yourself, at your work, the things that you do in your life as a Christian. Examine your own work. Don't be worried about Sue or Tom or Jake or any of those people. Just look at yourself, okay? We're so many of us in the fruit inspection business where we look at other people and try to examine other people's works and their actions and so on. And, and Paul is frankly telling us here to examine ourselves. And when you do that, you can have rejoicing in yourself alone. In other words, uh, uh, you're not critically looking at others, but you're looking at yourself. It, this is not a, a, a bad kind of rejoicing in yourself. In fact, I think it's even a different word than what we can misconstrue to be a bad kind of uh, a prideful type of rejoicing. That's not this. It's not this at all. But if we look at ourselves and see how God is using us and has worked in our lives. You know, when we stand before the Lord, our works are going to be examined, aren't they? Our works are going to be examined. And uh, what's going to happen to them? Well, some of them are going to be burned up, aren't they? Uh, we're not going to be burned up. We're not going to be judged. But our works are going to be examined. Our works are going to be judged. Some of it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And uh, that would be our works in the sense that they are works that we do without the Holy Spirit. They would be the works of the flesh. Good, good flesh, I'm talking about. Some of them might be good flesh. But they're going to be burned up. Others are going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. And I think that what Paul is saying here in this verse is examine your works, examine what you're doing, 
and see if those things are being accomplished by the Holy Spirit working in your life or are they being accomplished by yourself. And I think when you, what he's saying is when you see how God is using you in your life, and he does, when you see how God is, going to, is using you in your life, then you are going to have rejoicing in yourself alone. I remember one time, uh, I, uh, somebody outside of the church years and years ago, somebody died. And I was asked to get involved in it, and I did it. And so I went to the funeral home, and I can't even remember uh, who had passed away or what the situation was. But there was a, a young man sitting there that I recognized as being one of my students from the community college. I've only had about 15,000 of them, but I recognize this one. And so I sat down by him, and I, I didn't know what his name was. Uh, and I, he, I said, I've forgotten your name. Tell me who you are. And he told me. I think it was Mike. And so I sat down by Mike, and uh, I said, well, Mike, what's your relationship to the deceased and so on? We talked about it. And uh, he gave me a little hint that he didn't have a clue as to what was going on as far as as uh, death and, and the, what's going to happen afterward. And so I asked him, I said, what, what's your religious background? What, what background have you, have you come from? And he told me, I think he was from a Catholic background. And I said, well, Mike, I, I really got some good news for you. And I explained to him the gospel. And he said to me that he never heard it explained that way before. And I remember that night going home from that funeral home. I was by myself. I remember having so many tears in my eyes I could barely see the road because I knew God was using me. You see? The Holy Spirit, God uses us. And, and he works through us. And we need to examine our lives to find out those things and see those things and recognize and bless God and thank God for the way that he works in our lives. Now, I, know I, don't, I never saw Mike again after that, so I don't know what happened. He might be a Christian working in a church like crazy right now. I don't know. But uh, we leave that up to the Lord. But Paul, uh, Paul says, uh, examine yourself and, and look at how God is using you. And when you are rejoicing, you're going to be rejoicing because you're going to see how God is working in your life and not because you're examining someone else's life, you see. Not be t because you're trying to, to weigh what their life is. And then he says in verse 5, and this is the other one, that, the verse that seems to contradict, he says, for each one shall bear his own load. The word here is a, a different word than what we have up above. And this is uh, an expected load. It may be light, it may be heavy. Uh, remember the Lord said, take my yoke upon you, for it is light. Didn't he say, my burden is light, my yoke is easy? Uh, in, that case, uh, in that case, the burden was not a heavy burden. The burden in verse 2 is something that is occasional uh, burden in our lives, and it's a heavier burden. But this is uh, the, the type of thing that every one of us has. You may call it responsibility, if you like. God places burdens in our lives, responsibilities. Uh, it's, it's like... Uh, a backpack that soldiers wear. I got to thinking about all the students that I see with their book bags. You know, that's part of the uniform. Got to have a book bag. You got I'm sure you got a book bag, right? Got to have a book bag, see? Uh, everybody has a book bag. It's a neat thing. You just carry them on your back and sling it on the desk when you get there and take out what you need and so on. Everybody has some sort of a book bag in our lives. Everybody has some sort of a, a burden, a load. A responsibility. And, and Paul says here in verse 5, each one shall bear his own burden, his own load. Each one of, we're not, we're not looking for someone else to, to come along and, and take this. Uh, this is something that's peculiar to you, peculiar to me. We each have individualized types of uh, privately owned burdens that are in our lives. And God says, bear it, bear, bear up under it, <coughs> carry it. 
And uh, I like the idea of the idea of responsibility. God gives to each of us as Christians. Each of us as Christians has various responsibilities. And God says, be faithful to that responsibility, bear up under it. Your responsibility is not my responsibility. It's different. And we each have different areas of responsibility or different types of loads to carry. And God says when he's given you something, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have some sort of a responsibility in your Christian life and a burden in your Christian life, then something's wrong with you. Am I allowed to say that? Okay. <clears throat> something's wrong with you. You, you, you. We each have a burden, a responsibility that God gives us. And we need to bear up under that. Well, praise the Lord. God is seeking for us not to be looking out at others, not to be judging others or, or worrying about others, but seeking us to look at ourselves and see how God is working in our lives. And the best part of it all is that God is in the restoration business. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, don't give up on your young people. If your young people uh, aren't uh, doing what they should be, they aren't running with the Lord like they should be, don't give up on them. Don't ever give up on anybody because God continues to work in their lives and maybe he, he'll use you. As you walk by the Spirit and manifest the fruit of the Spirit, he'll use you to restore someone, to mend someone, to bring them back. Amen. Well, I'd like you to turn in your hymnal to number 625. 625. And here's how we're going to do this. Pay attention. The choir is going to sing this alone first, the first time. After the choir has sung it the first time themselves, then if you will stand and join them in singing it the second time, how am I doing? I'm reading it just like you wrote it here. <clears throat> and then after you have sung it, Remain standing while the choir sings the amens, the amen part of the song, and when you have finished, you are dismissed.